On the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome to the program uh, Cardoza Law Professor Susan Crawford and author, author, I should say, of Captive Audience. Uh, welcome to the program, uh, Professor. Thank you so much for having me on. Okay, so now I have to say that, um, well, as a uh, just, uh, the, I guess the irony is that uh, we had uh, trouble reaching you because of uh, your your wireless car- uh, coverage in your office. I uh, suffered the same issue, and uh, but you're not writing necessarily about that specific uh, issue of well, uh, maybe in some respects, yes, but. We have a lot of members of our audience, for some reason or another, at least that we hear from, who work for Verizon and AT&T. And so um, over the years, it's been sort of fascinating to watch what Verizon has done. Um, And and I want to get into their relationship with Comcast in particular. But let's just start with sort of the broad picture here. Tell us um, your argument that the internet, essentially, uh, our capacity to go online, really should be treated like uh, a utility, basically like electricity was a uh, hundred years ago. Well, thanks for the question. Um, yes, uh, people may not know this, but electricity was considered to be a luxury a hundred years ago, and ninety percent of farmers didn't have it, and it was controlled by uh, large trusts that had combined to control more than 85% of the electricity distribution market. Today, you can't start a new business or get a job or get a good education or get access to the most modern healthcare resources without having a wired connection to the Internet. And 83% of people who have smartphones also have wired connections. Uh, What's happened is that... um, for 19 million Americans, they can't get wired access at any cost because it just isn't available where they are. A third of Americans don't subscribe to a wired home connection, many because of cost, some because they just don't understand its relevance. And compared to other countries, prices are quite high in the United States and capacity is pretty low. Um, this has all happened because over the last 10 years or so, we've completely deregulated this sector, leading to both no competition in the market for wired Internet access, and, by the way, also pretty uh, low levels of competition for wireless access. Verizon and and AT&T really dominate that field. So no real competition and no oversight, which is uh, a terrible combination for something that Americans need, just like clean water and electricity. From a historical standpoint, I mean, just tell us what did happen with electricity, because you have this situation where um, it's obviously, in some respects, it's just simply not uh, worth it for a private entity to provide universal access. You know, those last uh, couple of miles, or in some cases, you know, back then, tens of miles were just simply not worth laying down the, uh, the, the copper, as it were, or the wire, um, to deliver electricity. Just give us a notion of exactly what the U.S. government did at that time. Well, this problem operates on a few levels. So for very far-flung rural areas, the federal government back in the 20s and 30s encouraged the development of rural cooperatives that would help uh, municipalities and communities help themselves to provide electricity where the incumbents found it uneconomic to serve those areas. So for electricity in rural areas, we encouraged rural cooperatives. And then in urban areas, made sure that uh, wholesale prices were regulated and that a standard for electricity was provided uh, for everybody so that we could operate all the machines and devices we want to. So fast forward, got a very similar situation now for very high-speed Internet access. Um, In most parts of the country, your only choice for a world-class wired Internet connection is your local cable monopoly. And that company isn't subject to very much oversight, if any, and for other parts of the country, they're just unserved, particularly rural areas. Um, so we've got a similar problem, an absence of competition in areas where competition is possible, and then an absence of service in areas where the companies feel it's uneconomical to go there. This is leading to a very large policy problem for the United States because everything we want to do, from client, climate change to uh, you know, improving health care to improving educational resources around the country depends on having a reliable, first-rate, uh, wired Internet 
network around the country. What well, what was the legal framework in which uh, the the idea that we would regulate um, um, utility companies uh, so that we could ensure that everyone had the um, the the ability to get electricity? Say, I mean, you know, the the argument that uh, I mean, there there it seems to me there's two arguments, and I and I have to say at this point that uh, I don't know if I have read as many. I mean, it's so clear there is a tremendous amount of pushback on the ideas in your book. Um, and I've had some pretty controversial, I've interviewed pretty controversial people over the year who've written, over the years, who have written fairly controversial books. And the amount of industry pushback as I uh, look, do research for this interview is, is stunning. Um, and, and so, I mean, I'm sure there was a time where people sort of felt like, well, you know, some people don't have electricity, other people do. That's just a, a function of it. What was the legal framework in which uh, uh, the government s- intervened in that marketplace? Well, you're uh, right to point out the historical parallel here. The exact same thing happened with electricity, by the way. Anybody who talks about municipalities making sure that they had electricity on their own or who talked about the necessity of uh, competition for electricity was also the subject of vitriolic attacks by the incumbents at the time. Um, When you talk to people who understand how these technologies work, who are living out in America and don't have adequate choices and feel they're paying too high prices, you'll learn that it it really is just the companies who are pushing back Mm -hmm. against the books against the book I've written. It's, it's not actually uh, the rest of America, I would say. There are a lot of hired guns out there for the incumbents, and uh, apparently they have nothing better to do than to turn their guns on me, a professor. So uh, what happened back in the 30s is that we took the view that it was an important necessity for Americans to have adequate oversight and reasonably priced elect- electrical service. And by the way, we've always taken that view when it comes to these essential services that have very high upfront costs that the market won't necessarily provide on an equivalent basis to everybody. Um, These companies are not evil. They're great American companies. They're doing exactly what their shareholders would want them to do. But that involves being very careful about the markets that they serve and finding ways to make money, more money from the same number of people. The cable industry, that's Absolutely true. Um, they, uh, for more than 80% of the country, when it comes to very high-speed wired access, it's going to be necessary for the new high-capacity, low-latency applications of the future. For most Americans, your only choice is going to be that local cable player, and their prices keep going steadily up, and they're subject to no obligations to serve everyone. So I'm just pointing out a factual problem. I do it dispassionately. I'm not angry at anybody. I just think it's a problem for the country going into the future. And, and the irony here is that there, there, there is no, I mean, uh, y- you have these cable companies been able to maintain this monopoly basically because they have been granted one on a, uh, on a local after local after local level. That's right. Yeah, the, that's right. Well, that's what happened. The, the Nixon White House way back in the 70s said it would be essential for cable companies to be treated as just transport and not also content companies um, because the risks of monopoly power in local um, areas were so great. Uh, And they also thought, as a conservative White House, that it would be less of a risk to regulate in that simple way to separate content from transport rather than to try to write all kinds of rules about how cable companies would discriminate or not in favor of their own content. So again, fast forward, and this is exactly what's happened. We um, gave cable companies exclusive franchises in the 60s and 70s. Even those, those were outlawed in the 92 Cable Act. In reality, it's extraordinarily difficult for any uh, competitor to get access to marketplaces where the big cable guys operate because they have to enter on two levels. They have to both build infrastructure and get access to programming. And the major cable distributors pay far less for programming because they're much bigger um, than any upstart new provider of transmission. So bottom line, uh, we've got a lot of market concentration when it comes to very high-speed wired Internet access. Cable is truly dominant. 
There are a few edge fiber players, and there's some exciting developments in fiber, like what Google is doing in Kansas City. But without major policy change, the whole country is not going to get the upgrade that it needs to compete on the world stage. I, I want to talk about uh, sort of what, what has happened with fiber. But um, the, so, so when, a, when a player like Comcast buys uh, NBC Universal. What they're now doing, essentially, is they're putting up two uh, barriers to entry. Uh, it, just to uh, restate, in some respects, what you're saying here, is they put up now two barriers to entry, aside from the fact that they had at least a de facto monopoly that existed. Uh, the first barrier is that uh, a competitor would have to come in and dig up a lot of ground to put in a cable. And the second is, is that once they had that cable and they actually reached the homes, they would end up having to, uh, they would have essentially uh, less opportunity to stream content because Comcast theoretically could say, hey, you know, uh, NBC is going to cost you a little bit more. All of our, um, all of the properties that we own in terms of developing this content, now that we've cornered that market, that's going to cost you more too. So th there's two, if not three, barriers to entry. Yeah, that's right. And a particularly important one in this context is sports because Comcast and Time Warner Cable but well, particularly Comcast. Com Comcast owns more than 10 regional sports networks, um, and that gives them tremendous power in local markets. It can decide what the pricing is going to be for that access to that programming. Now, it has to offer itself that same pricing, but that's pretty easy. That's just sending things from one pocket to the other. And then when it comes to uh, very small upstart new competitors, they often pay three or four X what Comcast or Time Warner will pay for the same programming as a distributor. The logic there from the programmer's standpoint is that they give a volume discount for the very big guys. But as you say, that operates as a tremendous barrier to entry uh, for new operators coming in trying to serve people with very high-speed transport. Google ran into that in Kansas City. It's had trouble getting access to Time Warner Cable's owned sports network at a reasonable price. And so uh, when we talk about, um, I, I want to talk too about uh, Verizon and Comcast relationship because it's a very strange relationship. Can you talk about the, the sort of the, the wireless and wired divide first and then let's talk about the, these, the, the, the strange agreement it seems to me that uh, uh, Verizon has with Comcast. Sure. Well, you can think of these as two separate, highly concentrated markets. So I've described the cable organization's power on the wired side. On the wireless side, Verizon and AT&T are dominant. They have two-thirds of the subscribers, more than 80% of the free cash flow. And a wireless connection could potentially be substitutable for a very slow wired cable connection, maybe 13 megabits download. The big difference between these two ways of accessing the Internet is that the wireless companies, AT&T and Verizon, impose very low usage caps, and it charge a lot for overages over those usage caps. So you probably have a one or two gigabit usage cap plan, um, and that means that if you try to watch a movie or anything like that, anything they use a lot of capacity over a wireless network, you'll end up paying a whole lot of money. So as a matter of reality, consumers treat wireless as something for mobile access, um, you know, a way to do things on the, on the go and send email and keep in touch, but it doesn't substitute for the wire in the home. So then looking over at the wireless marketplace, Verizon and AT&T, they have incredible barriers to entry in the form of their spectrum holdings. They were given uh, licenses to very low band spectrum back in the 80s. Uh, that sounds slightly technical. What that means is that they have access to frequencies that don't require as many towers to be built to be successful because those frequencies travel farther distances and go through walls. They're like Superman. So the corporate ancestors of Verizon and AT&T were handed those low-band licenses for free. They've since consolidated, and they have all of it. They have four-fifths of the low-band frequencies. That means that for T-Mobile to compete, it has to pay three or four X the amount that Verizon and AT&T do to build towers mm. because T-Mobile only has very high-frequency spectrum. Uh, so the big just keep getting bigger. Verizon and AT&T are growing by leaps and bounds. They're driving people into shared-use plans for families, and T-Mobile and Sprint don't constrain the pricing that Verizon and AT&T charge. I have hopes that 
T-Bone will and Sprint will in the future. Thank goodness that the uh, Justice Department blocked the AT&T uh, T-Mobile merger, which gives T-Mobile a voice. And now to the relationship between Verizon and Comcast. So now that you see these are two separate markets, uh, Verizon had been installing fiber in America and had planned to reach about 18 million Americans. Fiber is a better transmission technology than the cable lines because it has virtually unlimited capacity uh, and can provide for equal uploads and downloads. This, so is, this is their FIOS, this is their their FIOS, FIOS product, service yeah. that we all pine for in this office, but yeah, we don't have access to it. Yeah, it's a fantastic service. It really is good. It's very expensive here in America. In New York, it's a $200 a month, I understand. Hmm. Um, but starting in March 2010, Verizon just backed off because Wall Street was not happy with the long-term costs and uh, you know not immediate payoff of FIOS. So... That means that only about 10% of Americans will ever be reached by Verizon Fiber. And places like Alexandria and Boston aren't being expanded by Verizon. Again, a sensible decision. That's what their shareholders wanted them to do. But that's why Comcast faces so little competition, because that Fios product, which is just as good, if not better, than the cable product, overlaps in only 15% of Comcast territory. So they stand alone in most of their footprint. Their footprint, by the way, is huge. They cover 50 million households and 45% of the American population. So earlier uh, last year, Verizon Wireless and Comcast announced, and, and uh, Comcast and Time Warner Cable announced a joint marketing arrangement. Uh, Verizon gets Spectrum given to it by the cable companies. Cable companies had had access to Spectrum and now are giving it up. And in exchange... Uh, Verizon and the cable companies will co-market each other's services. So Verizon will say, great, you want Comcast cable? That's terrific. We'll also sell you Verizon wireless, and it'll be a, a big bundle for consumers, which might be very convenient. The problem is that implicit in this arrangement is a non-compete, is a sort of hold still for Verizon and its fiber product. Verizon has no incentive to continue with its fiber build-out, given its cooperative stance with the cable industry. In essence, they've said to each other, you take wired, I'll take wireless, and both of us will be able to continue to charge consumers more. And, and, what, and, and simultaneously, obviously, uh, also uh, Verizon is not only abandoning uh, Fios to the extent that, uh, you know, in terms of its build-out, it's mm -hmm. also abandoned in copper, uh, which means right. that, um, you know, even DSL service for those in rural areas, you won't be able to get it, it as well. Never mind wired uh, phone access in the home. Yeah, it's a very good point. So two-thirds of Verizon's revenues these days are coming from its wireless activities. You may think of Verizon as a wired phone company, but they're backing away from those lines as quickly as they can. We should say also, the, it's also a way for them to escape their unionization. Uh, they're unionized on the wired side. They're not unionized on the wireless side. They can escape a lot of obligations that way, including uh, the remaining vestige of regulatory oversight, which now really only applies to phone lines, copper phone lines. No. And it's a big problem for the country um, in that we don't have a way to think about how to respond to disasters um, for people who are relying on either just wireless connections or uh, a cable wired connection. Exactly. And either one of those. Are Once your power, power goes power out, uh, yeah. more or less, I mean, you know, sometimes your wireless will continue to work, but obviously your, your cable phone is gone at that point. Um, right. And, and your wireless phone will lose its charge quickly. So people in New York, as soon as they walked from downtown to 34th Street to try to charge their cell phone and then turn back, their battery had drained by the time they got <laughs> back to the, their homes in downtown New York. So and, we have a big problem for uh, electrical provision and uh, accompanying communications. Now, the, when you go. say the, the decision to uh, create this mo uh, monopoly. I mean, I understand it from the perspective of, like, their shareholders are saying this to uh, uh, Verizon. I also, I mean, I have my own sort of counter-narrative that, uh, in some respects, my guess is that the CEOs, uh, the top executives, and the board of directors uh, have far more incentives in terms of their stock options than necessarily what their shareholders are saying, although that is sensitive to the market. 
long term, though, from a Verizon standpoint, this isn't necessarily the smartest idea because at one point uh, we hit a critical mass where, uh, I mean, presumably there's a reason why we have this subpar service. And it is on one half the lobbying done by these, um, uh, these entities to simply um, mine for short-term, mid-term profits uh, in the most sort of, I guess, um, expected way possible. The other half of that seems to be that our, uh, the influence that our policymakers are subjected to in terms of lobbying and also a broader failure to come to the understanding because this is a relatively new technology. I mean, we're, you know, 10, 15 years ago um, that people have not accepted that the Internet is uh, to Americans today what electricity was to Americans 70 years ago. Yes, my main, my top priority for the book, for every bit of speaking I do, is just to get this on the radar screen for Americans so that they understand uh, how broken this marketplace is, how essential wired Internet access is for the country's future, and how in each community, each citizen has a responsibility to both understand and take action on this problem. Because without real political interest by Americans, none of this status quo is going to change. To give the cable operators all possible uh, heft on their side of the argument, they'd say, look, we're providing 100 megabit per second downloads to many neighborhoods in America. Well, the fact is, it's a very expensive service. Um, it's, not, it's not equivalent to what's possible with fiber. And we've reached a plateau that allows the cable companies to basically monetize that connection any way they want without any oversight or comp competitive pressure. So yes, they've built a service. It's a fast service, uh, but they are now harvesting, and that's not great for the country. And, and give, me a, um, uh, give me a sense of, uh, of your experience. I mean, you, you went to D.C. as a member of the transition team. Uh, you stayed on as an advisor on these type of uh, technology aspects, at least part of the uh, National Economic Council, I believe it was. Um, it, just give me your sense of where policymakers are. What, what is it that is creating this sort of logjam. And because as you talk about it, I, I, I can't help but think there's at least antitrust issues here uh, across maybe uh, there are issues in terms of the FCC and the way that they classify uh, the Internet and therefore the providers of Internet. Um, and obviously there seems to be a lack of awareness on a policy level of the implications of Americans universally having access to really quality um, upload and download speeds, and I'm talking relative to the rest of the world, or at least the industrialized world. Yeah, well, you've, you've identified a lot of the problems here. There is no political upside right now for uh, the administration or anybody on the Hill to do anything about this, um, because they don't perceive public outrage. Listen to what the president says when he talks about both gun control and immigration as domestic policies. He feels confident that the public cares about these issues and that he will be supported as he moves ahead. There is no such context right now for communications policy. And it is my goal to make sure that this one gets attention, too. It's going to take a while. Nothing happens immediately. And the companies involved do have enormous uh, political heft uh, and can continue to try to persuade people that what we're talking about is a luxury. But ordinary Americans know better. They know that you really can't live in the 21st century without this kind of facility in your house and business. And they should understand that uh, getting active will be essential for this whole thing to change. Can, can you tell us about what's going on in Kansas City with Google? And also, uh, you, you also discuss in the book Lafayette, Louisiana, because I think to ultimately that seems to me to be sort of the, uh, the way that this type of pressure bubbles up is that it may have to start on a very, very localized level. I think that's right. And I think federal policy takes so long to change and is so stuck in the ecosystem of Washington that we're going to see many more grassroots efforts by communities to help their own citizens and that that will shame other cities in America to act, and then gradually 
the requirement for having uh, world-class access across the country will become more obvious. So in Kansas City, uh, Google, along with any other company that could have offered Kansas City the same deal, Google has built a gigabit network that's 100 times faster than ordinary uh, high-speed Internet access uh, using fiber to the home. And uh, they did this in cooperation with the city of Kansas City. There's enormous excitement about what this is going to make possible. Startups are going there. Uh, the, the city's credit rating has already climbed. Uh, and there's a sense of excitement about the possibilities. When we started with electricity, people didn't think electricity was good for anything more than street lamps. And it took very conscious effects uh, of the world fairs around the turn of the century to show people what was possible with electricity and electric kitchens and all kinds of things. Kansas City is our world's fair for fiber access. It's going to demonstrate what businesses can do with this gigabit symmetric connectivity. Similarly, uh, municipalities across the country are thinking about launching their own uh, fiber networks or re calling for them, calling for their construction by either private or, or public entities. And that's happened in Lafayette, Louisiana, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in uh, there's some parts of Northern California that have this. It's, it's incremental so far. Seattle wants to do it. Chicago's heading this way. But it's going to take a while, and uh, local citizens seem to be supporting their mayors as they take the executive actions necessary to make these networks come into being. What what of WiMAX? Uh, I know you know um, I, I lived for quite some time uh, in um, the Columbia County, and uh, I know that in that area there's a lot of areas that are not covered at all by uh, you know you got to get a satellite, and half the time that doesn't work, and that's basically you know uh, like a dial up was. Uh, but I know that there are some towns that they're actually uh, experimenting with uh, sort of some form of WiMAX, which is sort of wireless broadband that, that spreads out over a town. W what's your feeling on that? Well, unfortunately, y WiMAX did have a lot of promise, but it hasn't been deployed on a commercial basis yet in America. Um, it, you know, so I have high hopes for better wireless connections, but they're not going to supplant the need for a wire. And here's why. A wireless connection, even a WiMAX connection, is just the last few hundred feet of a wire. So we're going to need fiber throughout the country to make sure that those wireless connections actually help us as we move between our, our homes and offices. And, and, and with that uh, fiber, ultimately, if we were in that position, we're going to need a new regulatory scheme in terms of, of access to it, right? I mean, on some level, we're going to have to n nationalize or at least uh, universally regulate that wire that goes from uh, that goes from that central hub to the homes or at least uh, to the neighborhood uh, so that the access to that delivery system is open to everybody. I mean, this is where something like net neutrality comes in, yes? Well, I, I am not in favor of nationalizing. What I'm in favor of seeing happen is private and public providers uh, building systems that are make wholesale access available where competition is possible so that lots of retail competitors can come in and, and at a reasonable cost connect to those networks. I'm interested in seeing uh, municipal networks develop across the country and ensuring that Americans get world-class access. That will require government intervention. This doesn't happen magically, and we're seeing that. The market is producing very consolidated market-powerful actors who have no particular interest in serving everybody in the country. It's not in their interest to do so. And that leaves out a lot of people and also leaves cities paying very high prices for very basic communication services. So lots of levels to this problem, lots of things to do. Um, but the first step, the very first step, is public awareness. Susan Crawford, author of Captive Audience, The Telecom Industry, and Monopoly Power in the New Gilded Age. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk, to about, uh, talk about that book today. Thanks so much.